this video was originally recorded at the annual Buddha and the Yogis retreat at Menla in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. The Dalai Lama special protectors. Yeah, I have on one of these pictures. I have a, a thing they see to her in her four manifestations. <coughs> she has a soul link in the internet. A lady called Lakso, a soul link. An amazing place where they go and they see visions of where the next Lama is being reborn. Who you know that story? That, that's her link. Well, the Lama soul link. I'm a Lakso. Ah. I was just thinking, oh, is this one? Excuse me? Hello? Hello? Yes. Oh, yeah, there you are. Oh. Yeah, when, when we were walking into these clouds, uh, the, the color of these rain clouds, that's the color of Durga, Kali. Sure. You know, that's the, what's the word Krishna actually Krishna means, too. is this color. Yeah. It doesn't, people translate it as black, but it, they're not really Blue black. Yeah, it's more like the, it's just like the clouds, you know, it's like you're looking at it, but you're looking not at a surface, but you're looking, you know, into this. Sure. Filled with the rain, right? Filled with the rain, yeah. Under they love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's the sound. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's Nirvana. <coughs> oh, Nirvana? Yeah, there is Nirvana. <laughs> if we only knew. <laughs> uh, that's where I call my consolation prize. Because I usually wait for the last day to talk about. Which is, uh, I, that's what I console myself with, the failing to attain Nirvana after 55 years of study. Um, almost 60 in this life. My consolation prize is that when you do attain nirvana, whatever it is, whatever future life, then you you revise your experience of all the infinite past moments that you spent, so that you realize you were already in nirvana at that time. So we, you will know that you are in nirvana now, retroactively. <laughs> You'll be back here. You can come. We'll go everywhere in time. And you expand like Apparently, yeah. they say. Yeah, now is then. Now, now, now is then. That's funny. Now is then. Then is now. That's why the Buddha was able under the tree to remember infinite previous lives. We can't remember our infinite previous lives because we suffered a great deal in those previous lives. And we naturally want to forget it. So we did. But he realized, when he realized the Arana, he realized it was always the case. So when the Absolute is the relative, then, then, uh, then you realize that somehow that helps. <laughs> anyway, yeah, come on. Come on. Kali. Durga. She has a rosary, they said, in the book. Yes. Oh, no, that's the chakra. Oh, that's the chakra. Yeah. So it said in the book she had a rosary. But I don't see a rosary. In that so Swati has a rosary. No, no, it said, no, no, no. In the in the version here, not in the not in the printed one, in this version. You know, in the first chapter. But you didn't show up as one didn't want to overwhelm us. It had uh, So that's, that is Durga slaying Mahisha. Mahisha. Uh, 
Hong Kong comedy. Here we go. Does he do it in the rotary? Let's see. She has um, ten hands, ten arms. She has a sword, viscous mace, arrows, bow, club, spear, and missile. Human head in one of the hands. A conch shell. I saw one of them Maybe that's what She often wears a, uh, a mala of, of human heads. Oh, yeah, of course. Maybe that's her version. Well, she's a mala for her human head? Or well, no, is it, is it, is it, is it a like Brahmin a, court? Yeah. It's a Brahmin right court right of human head. But you could do your mantra on human heads instead of... I, well, they, they have skulls that they're better than those. They do. <laughs> but they have uh, the Brahmin court. It's uh, made of human heads. Not all the Tibetan church things. Which are all Indian. All Indian. They have uh, 52 human heads. And they all have visible of the expression. And they're supposed to represent 50 negative emotions. Uh, and the like, letters of the alphabet, which are. Probably not true. Uh, no. You don't want to sneak those in. Oh, uh, every time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's really. That, if you want to get by, you say, oh, those are the names of letters of the alphabet. And everything. <laughs> <laughs> they, they stop asking. That's right, everything. That's the matrix. That's the matrix, the alphabet. <laughs> it's such a sensible alphabet, too. It's so brilliant. The German and Russian uh, philologists who discovered Sanskrit, when they discovered Sanskrit grammar, they invented linguistics. And then Veda do modern science called linguistics. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> right after, so what happens yeah. in this fifth chapter yeah. is um, the gods have gathered uh, and they sing this phrase. Um, and so they've gone to the Himalayas too. Uh -huh. Go ahead. The, they've gone to the Himalayas because basically as happens to the gods all the yeah. time, uh -huh. uh, they got their universes ripped off. <laughs> really? uh, by different demons. Yes, who that's true. Oftentimes were yoga practitioners. Yeah. And so all the great demons, you know, did yoga and learned mantras and, uh, you know, sacrifices. Yeah. Because they knew that was the way to, to play the system. Right. Uh, like some politicians, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah, so they would play the, they, understanding it, then they would play the system using sacrifice. Uh -huh. Just for the, their own accumulation of power and glory. Yeah. And so periodically they would come and kick the gods out of their heavens. Oh, no. And then the gods would be kind of, what do we do now that, you know, the, uh, what is it called, Hydra? No, it's, um, uh, you know, the shield thing. The what? what? No, that wasn't you, I was talking to you, who watched Shield, the TV series, the Marvel comics. Oh! So I didn't see Shield. Oh, okay. I, I that seen was most fun. of them. I, that that one. <laughs> I usually like most of the comic yeah. books. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 I didn't see that one. Okay. Anyway, so the gods are going. Oh, the enemy is the Hydra. Yes, right. Yeah, Hydra is the the god. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and so in this is so that's after we are our last namas namastasya 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 namo namaha uh -huh. um, and so. Then it goes on, and, and invoked by your, uh, by the, by the devas or the gods for the uh -huh. sake of their object, and adored by the <coughs> devas every day. Mm -hmm. May she, the Ishwari, the source of all good, mm -hmm. accomplish for us all auspicious things and put an end to our calamities. Mm. So the calamities are caused by these demons. Yeah. Um, and so, and who is now again revered by us, the devas, tormented by arrogant asuras, uh, and who called my mind by us, obedient with devotion, destroyed this very moment. So then the rishi, so all of these stories 
And this is a very cool thing. All of these stories are being narrated uh, by one rishi or one seer uh -huh. to some prince or to some king or uh -huh. somebody. And if you keep reading the text, you get to the end of a chapter, and that story of the rishi narrating is being narrated by another teacher to someone. And it turns out it's there's no end to the layers of the story. That everything is a story inside of a story. Uh -huh. uh, just like uh, we are all stories inside of each other's minds. You know? uh -huh. And in my mind, I'm the main character. <laughs> it's the story of me. Uh, but I haven't found another person that agrees with me. <laughs> it's the story of them. And, and that's the, the, the fun that a lot of these poets would, would have with uh, his myth. That everything was, in a sense, relative in that, in that it was a story within a story, within a story. And we have many stories, and um, it's the only trouble is when you, you really take, there's only one story, oh, yeah. the story of me. Yeah. So anyway, this is where then she appears, and so they, uh, they're, they're engaged in the, the praise of the goddess, and then Parvati came there. So they were sitting in the Himalayas just singing okay. the Mastasya and This is chapter 5? This is the last part of chapter 5. Okay. Verse 81. Okay. Chapter 5, verse 81. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We chanted all the way to the 7th. And so Parvati, uh, who is uh, Shiva's beloved, she's also called okay. oh, yeah. Shiva, is the feminine name. And so she appeared to bathe in the waters of the Ganga, and she, the lovely brow, um, she had beautiful eyebrows, said to those devas, who is praised by you here? Um, the question, an auspicious goddess springing forth from her physical sheath gave, so she asked the question, and then all of a sudden, uh, this goddess sprang out of Parvati. So uh -huh. the goddess comes out of the goddess, right. comes out of the goddess. Out of herself. Out of herself. Out of her subtle body. Yeah. Awesome. And so the goddess that came out of her said, this hymn is addressed to me by the assembled devas, set at naught by the Asura Shumba, and routed in battle by Nishumba. So at this point in the, the, the stories, we have these two demons, uh, Shumba and Nishumba. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to... The word Shumba, I think, just means bad, basically. Uh, so don't name your children Shumba. <laughs> Shumba? Yeah. Actually, Shumba is in Tibetan rituals. It has to do with directions. Oh? So many Shumba, they say, having to do when they're like reciting something about directions. That's interesting. Oh. This is the original story of that. What is the date we know, but they're all in time and memorial. Yeah. Beautiful. And, so and that's Ambika? Who, Ambika, yeah. And the one who came out of her sheath. Mm -hmm. And glorified as Koshika in all the world, she had issued forth. Uh, and when she came out, then Parvati became dark. And it was called Kalika, or Kali. Uh -huh. um, and stationed on the mountain line. Um, and so there, and so these two evil demons had two other evil demons as servants who traveled for them as ambassadors. And there's Chanda and Munda. And they saw um, Ambika Koshika, uh, who was extraordinarily beautiful. I mm -hmm. mean, and then, so then they saw that she was the most desirable object in any, anywhere. She was just yeah. overwhelmingly gorgeous, mm -hmm. sexy, uh, lovely. Uh, instant captivation. And so they went back to the evil, well, I shouldn't say evil, that's a matter of my, I shouldn't judge these guys. Mm -hmm. They went back to Shumba and said, oh king, there's a this certain woman, most surpassingly beautiful, dwells there shedding luster on Mount Himalaya. Mm -hmm. Such supreme beauty is never seen by anyone anywhere. Ascertain who that goddess is and take possession of her, <laughs> O Lord of the Asuras. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, basically 
these demons, of course, uh, their ego function gone wild. Mm -hmm. uh, narcissism incarnates. Um, yeah. And so she is, is the gem among women, exquisitely beautiful limbs, and she illuminates the quarters with her luster. O Lord of the Daiches, you should see her. And so, and then they go on and on praising him. Um, so whatever jewels, precious stones, elephants, horses, others are on the three worlds, they are not. So these demons had stolen everything from all of the gods. Um, you know, there it was almost like a, a I said the list of what, what what he stole is so beautiful in the sense it shows the richness of the Indian imagination and culture. Yeah, the jewels, precious stones, elephants, horses, and whatever in the three worlds they're now all in your house. Um uh, gem among the elephants. So this was uh, Indra's elephant. And they got ripped off. Oh, it's just like, what a score. Um, you know, and imagine, like, you, you became, well, I shouldn't, but imagine you became envious of, you know, the, the POTUS, the, the president, and you managed somehow to steal uh, all of the Trump Towers around the world. And then Melania, and you stole them all. And that's what. Okay, but this is the reverse situation. This is the man has finally, uh, you know, played it, and he has stolen all of the best things. And uh, so, in your courtyard, there's the wonderful chariot yoke of swans, a wonderful gem of clouds, and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, Anyway, so on, on hearing this, uh, the reason, on hearing these words, Chanda and Munda, of Chanda and Munda, Shumba sent the great Asura Sugriva as messenger to the Devi, go and tell her thus in my words, do the thing in such a manner that she may quickly come to me in love. Okay. And just what caught me, is, it just reminds me of some contemporary personalities that I read about in most every day in the news. The nice thing here is that my Wi-Fi connection is sometimes flickers, and I can't really read the news carefully. So, so I don't uh, have to worry about it. Okay. Um, and so he, basically, they, anyone, the, the ego function eventually gets to this point when all of a sudden coming across that which is sacred has to possess that which is sacred. Um, in other words, the, having taken over the whole solar system, these demons now have to possess the goddess, and they have to possess the truth, the god or goddess. And so that's, the ego is always unsatisfied, uh, because there's no pleasure in what it does. Okay. So, I'm hearing these words, Chandan sent the greatest source of Riva, and so, and he went there and he uh, spoke to her these sweet words, O oh, Devi, Shumba, the Lord of the Asuras, is the supreme sovereign of the three worlds. Uh, I have come here to your presence, hearken to what is said by him, and whose command is never resisted among the Devas. And so, and then they go on saying what Shumba says, you know, that Shumba is now the Lord of all the three worlds. Basically he's replaced Indra, and is hoping to replace, you know, all of the gods. And and yeah. okay. um, so then the saying. Take to me, so the Shumba has sent this message, take to me, uh, or to my younger brother Nishumba, of great prowess, O oh, unsteady eyed lady. So, unsteady eyes, because she's seeing everything, you know. If you look into her eyes, it's like, it's like looking at these clouds out there. Um, 
will you get by um, wealth and great and beyond compare you will get by marrying me. Think this over in your mind and become my wife. Okay. And so the, the guy's being, you know, as, as romantic as he could be. I think she's being romantic, yeah. She Yeah, and the, so, thus told, Durga, the adorable and auspicious by whom this universe is supported, then became serene and spoke. And she was being very, very polite. Uh, you have spoken the truth. Nothing false has been uttered by you. Uh, Shumba is indeed the sovereign of the three worlds, and likewise is also Nishumba. And so, you have to realize in this mythology, within your universe, you experience the three worlds. And so your ego functions of Shumba and Nishumba in are indeed the possessors of the three worlds. Okay. But you've just made a mistake. Mm -hmm. and, and so here's your trick. Um, but in this matter, how can that which has been promised uh, be made false? Hear what promise I had made already out of foolishness. So years ago, when she was a teenager, she made a vow. And this is, he who conquers me in battle, removes my pride, and is my match, is strength in the world, and shall be my husband. So let Shumba come here, then, or Nishumba, the great Asura, vanquishing me here, let him soon take my hand in marriage, and why the thing? Okay. And so here's where you know the, the attitude shifts. The message, oh Davy, you are a haughty. <laughs> <laughs> Using the B word. Talk not so before me. Which man in the three worlds will stand before Shumba and Nishumba? Which man? All the Devas cannot stand face to face with even the other Asuras in battle. Why mention you, O oh Davy, a single woman? Indra and all the other devas could not stand in battle against Shumba and other demons. How will you, a woman, face them? On my word itself, you go to Shumba and the Shumba, let it not be that you go to them with your dignity lost, being dragged by your hair. Hmm. So we get the actual attitude of the romantic, you get their actual attitude. Yes. You know, okay, bitch, okay. <laughs> um, Thank you. And the Devi said, yes, it is. Shumba is so strong, and so is Nishumba. Exceeding, what can I do since there stands my ill-considered vow taken long ago? Go back and tell the Lord of the Sewers carefully all this that I have said. Let him do whatever he considers proper. Okay. So, that's the point. And so then they um, start to send armies to... Uh, try to capture her and kill her. Um, then the next chapters are the slaying. Yeah, slaying. Slaying. Oh, it's going to be a long, drawn out thing. Yeah. But it's uh, particularly interesting in that it really captures the, uh, one, the culture of the, the the male misogynist culture mm -hmm. that is really dominant mm -hmm. uh, in uh, classical Vedic mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's still dominant today. And um, and this is why, of course, you know the the, the critiques. Oh well, the the which I think are natural were the and you were mentioning them the other day where you know some scholars think well the um, the uh, Dakinis and the, 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 the Tantrika girls who were cultivated in the temples, mm -hmm. you know, they're only being exploited. But then you pointed out that they're actually practicing. Mm -hmm. And they're actually practicing very deep, concentrated yes. yoga. Perhaps, it, you know, to the point, you know, of even more practice and concentration than the, their male consorts. Mm -hmm. and so, in a sense, uh, the uh, culturally here, uh, there was this rising up of the Shakta tradition, the, the Tantrika. The, this is outside the Orthodox tradition. Oh yeah. 
Um, and it's coming from perhaps an a endless variety of other little traditional indigenous cults and well, religions. Um, well, I think maybe not just indigenous, but... Can you turn your mic on? What? Is the mic working? Unmute your mic. Whose mic? Unmute yours. <laughs> what do you want? Unmute it. You, you muted it. Mine? Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's muted. Oh, it is. <laughs> Why does that matter? Oh, he's talking. Okay. So, uh, I muted it on purpose. <laughs> I know, it's wonderful. I love this. Does it, did, was she wasted? She wasted? Did, 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 you were going to read the next chapter? <laughs> she really gets them. I was just thinking, you know, Parvati? Yeah. It's like me. It's, I mean, the mountain, right? The, the, the one who has a mountain, the daughter of the mountain, Parvata. And just, it just coincided in my brain with Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> she says, few miracle powers short. Close, Right. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the next chapter, they, they sent this guy, um, Dumra Lochana, uh, which basically, uh, Lochana means eyes, and Dumra, I think, means cloudy eyes. So maybe. Probably, yeah, probably Dumra, Dumra, Smoky, yes, smoky Dumra. eyes, which, this is, these are actually cataracts. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so angry, his eyes are bulging and bloodshot, right? Oh, okay. Tears. <laughs> Dumra Lochana. And so he, the he went army. forth and accompanied by 60,000 suras. Soldiers of asuras. Which I think is not fair to call the asuras demons. I, I think, think they're, yeah. they're titans. You know, in those, those Italian muscle movies that they make, you know, where they, they have the titans and the gods, you know. And they, these are just titans. Mm -hmm. They're like gods, very similar in body, but they just like to fight rather than to uh, screw, you know. The gods like sex and they like to fight. Yeah, like, like in the Greek mythology, the titans preceded the gods, and the gods were a little bit more uh, enjoyers, and yes, right. sit around on Olympus, right. and eat good stuff, whereas yeah. the titans love smashing mountains. That's right. Creation. So they're not really demons, they're more like no. just like the gods, you know. They're kind of old fashioned. Violence, they, they get into violence. <coughs> yeah. And so. So that this demon, on seeing the Devi station, on, he asked her aloud, come to the presence of Shumba Nishumba. If you will not go to my Lord with pleasure, here I take you by force, distressed one, dragged by your hair. So that's it. And the Devi said, you are sent by the Lord of Asuras, mighty yourself, accompanied, accompanied by an army. If you thus take me by force, then what can I do to you? And and so then, thus told the Asura Dumra Lochana, rushed towards her, and thereupon Ambika reduced him to ashes with the mere heave of the sound. Hum. Hum. <laughs> That's what I knew there was something this morning. That's Taragwag. Hum. Hum. So that is a, a wonderful mantra, seed mantra. Oh, oh it's intense. Yeah, it's hum. And back to the alphabet, all things return to the alphabet. What? Back to the alphabet. Yes. We, we have at the end of the vowels the anuswara. Yes. Now this is, the, that's the... Mm. Right, nasalization. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I love. I'm just, I'm just getting into it. <laughs> and, uh, it stimulates the bindu. It stimulates the, moon, the bindu, you know, in the and brain. it's a huge thing in the, the Sanskrit. Uh, sure. It's almost like that is the, because it stimulates the bindu and opens the talu mula, uh -huh. which is the gateway to the moon, mm -hmm. or the nectar, mm -hmm. uh, it causes the one, the cessation of language, mm -hmm. because it's the perfection mm -hmm. of all the flavors, it's the perfection of all the rasas. Mm -hmm. in that taste of nectar, which is there in the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was speaking with uh, Shell about Brahmari, which is one of the classical forms of pranayama, uh -huh. uh, 
that's a great training exercise. Uh -huh. Particularly for people who don't like pranayama. <laughs> I don't want to hold my breath. And so we tricked them and said, well, let's pretend that we're knees. Mm -hmm. And so you just inhale, try this. Mm -hmm. You gotta sit straight. There we go. Mm -hmm. so that you eventually can do it continuously. Same feeling, same sound in as you go out. Mm -hmm. Like the didgeridoo. The, yeah. <laughs> so, and you can try it and it, and it gets, uh, and then it's a little choppy when it first starts coming in when you're learning it, but you just don't freak out. And well, that's it, really hard while you're yeah. inhaling. You feel like you're making the same sound as inhaling. Same sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Actually, the, the Tibetan thing they say, that's why I write it with the H-U-M, with the dot on top, and then a G after the M, because they say that you shouldn't close the lips. Yeah. So that it's like, hum. But I just realized that that helps turn the tongue back yeah. up. Right to you know get the tongue going back up to the uvula or to whatever it is the talo. Right? Kachari mudra. The what? Kachari mudra. Kachari mudra. Yeah. The sky going. Sky flying mudra. So by you do it. Once you get the once you get the hum going, it doesn't matter what the position of tongue. You really got to hit me. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, it's the sound of the bee. Yeah, home is a really big one. <laughs> and so this is considered the, the point of, of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a universe. If you go up any anybody anywhere, uh, you know, I'm sure on other planets too. You know, you just go up and you go. Mm. And they go. Mm. You know that language. It is definitely that. And so it forms like the in chanting. It's like the thread that everything else is strung on. Mm -hmm. So it, you you form the mala, the garland of events, but there's a string. And the, if there are any gaps, like in your thoughts mm -hmm. or anything, there's, there's, there's that string there, which is... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. What we call gradual repetition in the perfection stage. The Om is the body of the Buddha, all Buddhas. And the Ah is the speech. Ah, with the, with the, ah. With the, with the Sarga. Ah. And then the Hum is the mind of all the Buddhas. And it goes with the exhalation. Mm. They say red, white, and blue. White, red, and blue. Really. She waves him, and then the lion, the vehicle of the deity, shaking its mane in anger and making the most terrific roar, fell on the army of the Asuras. And I like the Singhanada. Yes. Which is. It's in another symbolizing in Buddhism the teaching of selflessness or emptiness. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's the nada, which is mm -hmm. so the nada is like a lion's roar. Mm -hmm. But it's silent. It's sound, but it's silence. Mm -hmm. It's silent sound. So mm -hmm. it roars like open space. And it's the sound of, you know, where all the cobra hoods open over the heads of many of the deities, mm -hmm. uh, gods and goddesses. Uh, and each of those heads mm -hmm. sings. Mm -hmm. They're musical, either the Nagas mm -hmm. are musical. So this is, mm -hmm. And 
and in different stories, you know, that sometimes they're decorated. Each head wears a crown mm -hmm. of effulgent jewels, and the, and they're all focused basically, uh, like a uh, like a uh, like like a a dish, you know, mm -hmm. that focuses, you know, at the heart, the mm -hmm. center, uh, on the beloved. And but they're all singing, and if you listen to one of them sing, then you might understand the words. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be they're singing in you know, some language, mm -hmm. Sanskrit, and they're singing. Namaskasya, namaskasya. Another head is singing. Yeah, they're whole. There's a whole group of Tibetan heads, Sanskrit heads. <laughs> Holly heads, weak heads, <laughs> and then those are just human languages. But these heads, they're an endless number. So there are many, many other languages that we know very little about. It. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of the sound together, if you listen to them all at the same time, it's called nada. And you just sit there and you and you open your ears, and this is when the breath stops and what they go, kevala kumbhaka. So mm -hmm. when prana and apana mm -hmm. uh, finally link together, either in pelvic floor or in the navel, mm -hmm. or across the palate, or anywhere, because mm -hmm. they love linking mm -hmm. wherever they get a chance. Be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then the nadis, uh, then you start to get kumbhakas, in which you retain the breath, okay. But you're not doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. It's just like you become so like. What's the word? Absorbed. Absorbed. What's that word in Southern? Awestruck. Oh. Because awesome. it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, you become awestruck, and you're. The, and you're just listening. Total mm -hmm. attention. It's not like you. You know, the, the attention mm -hmm. is like absolute fascination. What. Uh, but so fascinating that the, the mind can't formulate, you know, like fantasy stories or myths about it. Mm -hmm. And those, that's the effect of nada. Mm -hmm. So nada is really the, um, so the lion has just roared. And mm -hmm. who knows, maybe this is an allusion to uh, well, and it's mm -hmm. like other you groups. Have, you have disappeared, like we were saying oh, yeah. earlier. That's this moment where you have disappeared, just like you mm -hmm. were saying earlier, where there's no awareness that you're even there for just a second mm -hmm. until you think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And then right. you're there. You go, I'm so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but it's this it's this spontaneous ex experience of that moment of absorption, of release. And the absorption is, is more like a, a, a just a, a being, a, I don't know, I don't like to use the word awestruck. We were just in um, L.A. a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, what? We were just in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Whenever we go to L.A. It's, and it's so we, awesome. Yeah. Everybody uses that word. They pick us up. Airport. And it's, oh, that was awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> it's like two minutes off the plane. In Canada, it's sorry. We're into special effects. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's almost like it's such an appreciation of the other, it's an appreciation of life and form mm -hmm. as openness, uh -huh. as emptiness, that, mm -hmm. that you forget the constructed self, the theories mm -hmm. of self. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, you know, it deals with that apparent conflict between nirvana and samsara, mm -hmm. that's a mind-created problem. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the the nada the nada thing is it's a really gorgeous uh, mm -hmm. way of looking at it. Um, it's something that's easily because we're all hearing sound, even if we're. You know, I'm just thinking, and but it's sacred sound. We just don't listen to what we're hearing, mm -hmm. and we don't really feel what we're feeling. And it turns out we don't even think what we're thinking. <laughs> but that's another stage of it. So, so her lion. So, this morning we were sitting on a swan. Did anyone try that in their own mind? It's a little bit like 
you got to get a strong swan. So these are swans that are volunteers. They say, I want to be sat upon by a baby. And they're so, they just light up and they're like, now I'm, you know, I'm a chauffeur for the goddess. And I go around and they represent the everything. And so, in your imagination, uh, it's, you'll start to feel your pelvic floor uh, in a totally different way. And this is an enormous, um, it's not an obstacle, but it's something, it's so unfamiliar mm -hmm. for people to actually feel their own prana, mm -hmm. uh, to feel sensation directly, uh, because it's the mind so automatically wraps, uses it as a takeoff, a, a launch pad for a story or a memory or mm -hmm. you know, a complaint. Or it is the vehicle of, of thought, yes. Yeah. And, uh, no, really. and so a, a lot of the, in yoga is getting, it's kind of tricking people into feeling things that are actually quite available, you know, they're close at hand. Mm -hmm. um, but they're just not used to feeling it as, and looking at it or feeling it, you know, as sacred in and of itself. Yes. Uh, and so just, a lot of this, these are just tricks to get you sitting on a lion. Now that's, that takes some nerve. <laughs> <laughs> well, the lion likes you. <laughs> it's family. Indeed. And you're, I think I'm writing about uh, Buddhist science and uh, you know, about how Buddha discovered relativity. And in trying to make it understandable to the modern people, they feel that you know they have all these machineries that externally, you know, like the cloud chamber, the electronic accelerator, and then this thing where like where they discovered the Higgs boson, which for for a brief moment, within the three percent of the universe, according to their theory, that is visible. Right? They, they had something that accounted for mass. And so they can't believe that someone without any machine would, for, for example, predict the infinite divisibility of matter, which they are afraid of. You know, in 1926, they, uh, Bohr and Heisenberg said, sorry guys, when we get to a certain level of magnification that you lose track of it and there's no objectivity and your act of observing even to a machine disturbs what you're doing, so there's no such thing as objectivity. So your mental subjectivity is part of the problem. So this, you know, there's no absolute thing there. You can only deal with probabilities at a much coarser level. And then you can still invent stuff and make money and blow people up and stuff like that, but you can't actually pin it down. And they're still frightened of that, even so today. So I'm trying to explain how the Indian, the great Buddha and the great Indian yogis created, I mean, after all, we, when we see something, they explain some sort of photon hits the neuron, and these are molecules and atoms, and then they organize it in the brain somehow, it sends over like a concept and it fits over and says, Oh, Richard! <laughs> and by organizing all kinds of like buzzing, blooming things that are going on, right? But actually, we are in seeing, we are, we are, con our consciousness is all of these micro processes. So then the samadhi stabilization is such that then you become conscious at the level of the micro, yeah. micro process. And then you, because that is your machine, your own neurology is your machine. And then, and then you, you even go below where there are molecules operating and it's pure light. And you're in the realm of light. It's too subtle to be like, like he thinks, Einstein thought that light you couldn't go, nothing could go faster than light, or there was nothing beyond the speed of light because mass became infinite at that time, which means it doesn't mean anything, right? It's no longer like an object as compared to another one, it's infinite. But in that event horizon of that mass becoming infinite, there's like an infinite plane. There's all kinds of micro levels. And you could be aware of that out of your own nervous system if you developed yourself into a super, super duper sub electron, pure wave particle differential transcending machine, yeah. biological machine. And therefore, it's a replicable experiment by a scientific machine, and other people can replicate it with their own machine, which is their own freaking nervous system. 
yeah? <laughs> it feeds right into DNA. So there's no reason why they couldn't have discovered that in a scientific manner in ancient times, the great Rishis and Buddha and everybody. Is that, was that work for you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just paying attention. Huh? They're just you know, yes, paying super, fine, fine yeah. attention. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then a lot of our fascination, you know, uh, you get this feedback of you're, you're watching internal sensation, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then like what we'll call prana, mm -hmm. which is prana shakti, mm -hmm. uh, and then they say buddhi and prana, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but you can actually watch the sensation itself or the prana itself, mm -hmm. and the prana and the mind, the chitta, mm -hmm. always correspond. So mm -hmm. if your mind takes on any type of pattern, and it could be you know, an entire story, mm -hmm. or just a, a brief memory, or any kind of recognition or something, mm -hmm. there's a corresponding physiological sensation pattern that totally relates to it, mm -hmm. it's the foundation. Mm -hmm. And if you can uh, just go back and watch the sensation pattern so closely, uh, if you just watch it, then as it starts to create the story, you're aware of that and you return to the sensation. Or uh, for a beginning meditator, just return to the breath. Uh -huh. and so, yeah. so we're talking about, even though you're not breathing, you have internal breath as you're watching. Mm -hmm. uh, so rather than inhale, exhale, you're watching. And in this way, the samskara, or the patterning, the unconscious patterning, uh, is uh, unwound, mm -hmm. and you, then you start to see the endless amazingness, the depths mm -hmm. of just what is immediate. Uh, and so, exactly. much of this imagery is visualization mm -hmm. tricks, just like, um, you know, in, in modern yoga classes, they, they, you know, we like to teach people uh, anatomy and biomechanics, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, this is the f this is literally the physics of how you're standing, how the joints work, and this is mm -hmm. why your hip hurts, and, mm -hmm. and that's wonderful stuff, and uh, we use it. But some of these older artists, these yoginis and yogins, they had, you know, a much more refined sense of it, mm -hmm. which in included the, you know, the bones. And Issues, but it went much deeper into what mental concepts and emotions mm -hmm. all have to do with the life. Mm -hmm. So the visualization of the deities uh, is a big part of uh, the yoga traditions. Mm -hmm. And of well, course, this is, huge this is where emptiness comes in again, in the sense that um, my friend with the beard, Diabola, in Tibet, the Dalai likes to talk to people with a good beard, they call him Gyavola. Yeah, Gyavo means the beard. So Gyavala, so Gyavala is very interesting for him, which is that emptiness is needed to dissolve the routinized imaginations with which we are every, every day and every minute constructing the familiar world that fits with our concepts. So, and projecting into that world all those conceptual patterns, so it seems like the window, the notion of window is out in the window, you know, and I'm just reacting to it, rather than that it's this concept in my mind of window. And so that's why people say, oh, I can't do visualization, they often say, you know. So the emptiness thing shows, rather than, it shows that the window is nothing, or that my brain is nothing, or that the daily body is nothing, or that that are, it melts the exclusivity of our habitually envisioned world. And then the imagination becomes more pliant and more flexible and more fit, and then therefore when you create a deity body, you really see it and feel it. So you can really feel like your shoulder joint has like uh, 16 arms coming out of it or something, whatever that might feel like. But you can't do that when you really think you have the one phantom limb, right? The one phantom limb has a model in the brain that enables you to feel you have the, when it's an actual limb, but if it was amputated, I would still think it was there because it's a model in the brain, right? Phantom limbs. So, so emptiness is essential, and that's wisdom, that's the problems of wisdom. 
to realize the pliability and the mutability of, of energy and, and matter. So you can then shape it in a better way. Does that tie in a little bit with the idea of the intuitive sense that you were talking yes. about last yes. time? Yes, well, I think so. Yeah, and that the more you practice and begin to trust the ideas yes. of a visualization, so you're, you're not having to control it yourself, right. and you're, you're visualizing it, you then tap into that right. aesthetic. Now, I'm trying to use your intuition because intuition has these two main locuses in English, trying to escape from gnosis. Yeah. And one of them is, of course, female intuition, which of course then people want to put down. That's what scares my fellow trying to say, oh, no, that's intuition. That's right. She says, oh, we should, go to the, we should go to the baseball game today because it's going to rain, you know, at intuition. You know, it was a useless thing. They were born to say. But in Kant, uh, which is like the best, or in the English translation of Kant, the, the, um, uh, the word and the German word for intuition, same word, um, uh, is used for unmediated experience, something. So knowledge that has no conceptual mediation. So it's a very technical word like that. It's a direct experience, you know, it's an experience. And when there's no conceptual mediation, <laughs> when there's no conceptual mediation, then that means that the difference between subject and object is somewhat transcendent. In other words, since there's no conceptual mediation, which operates by exclusion, you sort of merge with what you're knowing. So it's kind of non-dual in that sense. So, so I want to combine those two things with the female one, in also to honor the female, that these knowledges are, and, and my, the metaphor is the mirror image. So when we, when we have, we, since we know what a mirror is, and they pretend that ancient people or tribal people don't know that, but they all look into a still pond of water, so a bunch of baloney, they, do, they, they understand what a reflection is, right? Even without a physical mirror. And anyway. Even our cat. What? Yeah. Okay, well, everybody but my dog. <laughs> so my cute dog, he will find this one mirror in one place. Because that stands on the ground in, in my daughter's house. Yeah. And he, when he go, we go visit that house, he'll go in there and bark at that house. Oh, that's good. All my boys are running around. He's learned, he'll learn. But my point is, we know that, right? So we know, we have had the knowledge that that is a mirror reflection and there's not a room in there. And we look at a mirror. And when we then look at a mirror, we deal with the, the reflection like on the surface, but we don't rethink that it's on the surface. We, that's intuitively known. In other words, we, we know that knowledge is part of our being, actually, that it's a mirror reflection. We don't have to think it through. And yet it's simultaneous with our perception of the details of whatever we're doing in the mirror. Or we're looking, or in a car mirror, we're looking at the rear view. We even will correct left and right distortions and things without thinking, too. So that's all, that's where I'm trying to get the, that's a big image, the, the mirror reflection. For example, since when we see table in our normal projecting of concept, mixing of conceptuality with our ego structured world, um, we, we, we um, uh, the table, when we then, when we then have had some experience of seeing the table disappear or something, we realize the arbitrariness of that and it becomes empty, we have a recognition of its emptiness of any intrinsic tablehood, so to speak, then, um, then when we look at the table, it's the thing that most seemed solid to us and, and resonated with our sense of our own solidity, but yet we now know it's a mirror of reflection, and the surface of the mirror is emptiness. So we realize it's as mutable as any mirror reflection. You know, that, you know, in other words, that, that's the analogy. So then interacting with samsara without leaving nirvana, the, the, the being in nirvana doesn't have to be thought. It's, you know, you can be completely present in, this, in, in this other people's samsara and uh, try to help them out of it, and yet you don't leave nirvana. And then your intuition is what keeps you hit to, uh, hooked into nirvana, not doing something. That's, and that's what I'm trying to do yeah, yeah. with the word intuition. Yeah, that's a what good do you definition. Think? I think it's a good definition. You do? Oh, yeah. that's we great. Have to train Got the yoga people. stamp of approval. That's better than right. good housekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> good. Yeah, because you're seeing the, the thing in itself, as I said, you know, like 
Heidegger's at the Ding on the Sea, yeah. thing in and of itself. Yeah, which, which context? But that you're seeing it in, con in its endless context. Yes. Back, you're seeing the whole background yes. of the table. And so, yeah. and your intelligence is then sharp. Yeah, although, so, although I would put it that the, you find that it's empty of a Ding on Sea. And the, yeah, the, the, even the, the ding, ding itself is the, is yes. everything it's connected to. It the ding is empty. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. with Kant and those guys, they didn't really have an energy of wisdom, although he was reincarnation of Indian yogi, for sure. <laughs> he was chicken-breasted, you know. Do you know Kant was? He had like, a, his bones were deformed in his chest. And, and in a threat medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, though, if your prana gets the two distorted, it, it weirds out your skeleton. Because it actually connects, it's more powerful than the bones. From prana, you know, chi, right? Yeah. So uh, he was a yogi who went to the wrong land in in in, uh, in Lithuania, but uh, or in Eastern Germany at that time was sort of part of Germany's place. But he was so brilliant. Oh, really. he, he he brought it. He brought this sort of began started this whole awareness in the West that the Indian yogis and the Buddhist philosophers and so had long ago. Oh, that's so cool. All of mm, mm. <laughs> My tongue was getting lost in the back of my mouth. Because there's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. But it's very key not to get stuck, though, in the disappearing. No more disappearing. No disappearing. No way. No. That is, you know that. Do you realize that? I'm sorry to say this is a horrible thing to say, but do you realize the Irvikapa Samadhi defined as a complete and permanent leaving of everything is basically the hallowing of a, psych of a psychotic experience, psychotic episode, as enlightenment. Because someone feels completely aloof and isolated from everything. It's the ultimate male chauvinist refusal to go to the kitchen <laughs> ever again. And it's therefore not enlightenment. Yeah, it's an interpretation. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> what? It's an interpretation by non, yeah. non people who don't experience it, and so they they interpret it dualistically. Yeah, but they're aiming for that, you know. They well, they aim see. dualistically for yeah, yeah. escape. Yeah. Yeah. Te Theravada Buddhists sometimes do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, Buddha they, knew that. That's why he let them. But then the thing is... Yeah, and then, then people interpret, you know, the Sankhya, uh, the Yoga Sutra Kaivalyam. Yes. They interpret that as, uh, you know, what their con conception of Nirvikalpa Samadhi is. And they, then, and so there's the reaction by these people, the Shaktas, mm -hmm. the Bhaktas, of yeah, Kaivalyam sure. Narakayate. Kaivalyam what? Narakayate. That Kaivalyam no. is hell. Oh, oh, really? Nada, oh, Nada, 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 they don't want to be really polite about how they really freak out. <laughs> and then they look really dubious too. And then you just mention, okay guys, how about you have a little like zygote in your belly for like 10 months and to carry it around? I'd like to see you do that. And then pull your pelvis apart and like shove it out. <laughs> you try it guys. See how you like it. Yeah. Huh? Well, yeah, the Ganesh belly meditation is one, it's, it's, it's a way of trying to get, you know, males who attempt to visualize Ganesh belly, you know, are, are becoming sympathetic towards the idea of pregnancy. That's right, you know, it's like, oh. Actually, there's the most incredible picture on the cover of the latest Vanity Fair. That's really, did anybody else see it? You cannot believe it. It's super pregnant Serena. Wow. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's like a force of nature. Mm. No, I mean, it's like Navy or something. Yeah. It's, it's huge and powerful. It's just, you know, just naked from the side, you know. And it's like, this, it's just so immensely powerful, you know, really. Mm -hmm. Like when Mitch McConnell or something like that sees that they must, <laughs> they must pass out. <laughs> <laughs> they don't read the thing. 
No, they would pass out, those guys. Totally. It's like they ran into like a giant like water buffalo chasing them around the, their, their subconscious. But we have these terribly backward emotional plague people. They're not even asuras or what? They're not even asuras or titans. But they're sort of asuras. They are like asuras, yeah. They Actually, there's another thing that begins with ass that they <laughs> So anyway, so she wasted the army and then what happened? <laughs> So the, the lion, some asuras it's slaughtered with the blow of its forepaw, others with its mouth, and other great asuras by treading over with its hind legs. The lions with its claws tore out the hearts of some and severed heads with the blow of the paw. And its severed arms and heads from others and shaking its mane drank the blood from the hearts of others. Oh! In a moment, all that army was destroyed by that high spirit and exceedingly enraged lion who bore the deity. <laughs> Intense. Very good. Just couldn't, I wanted to see what happened. So this is the divine feminine in action. Uh, the uh, anger, so the, the anger is joyous, um, like Kali's anger and stuff. Yes. Or, or, you know, remember the scene where Kali just starts slaughtering? I don't know around. that scene. No, what is uh, that? And she gets a little bit out of control. Yeah. You know, she has her cleaver and she's just like cleaving people hit left and right. And, and then Shiva, in order to stop her, oh. says he goes out and he gets in front of her and then lies down. And she's just about to uh, do him in. And then she sees who it is. And she goes. <laughs> <laughs> and her tongue comes out. And that's, so she experiences a suspension of language function uh. of the whole story because she finally, uh, in this story, she's a little bit out of control. I see. It's becoming a problem because uh, yeah, yeah. they tend like to be slaughtered. <laughs> and, uh, so she, but she actually then sees who it is that's you know the right. the victim that she's slaughtering. Right. But it's actually her beloved, and she doesn't want to hurt her beloved. Her hurt her oh her lover. Yeah. Yeah, because she's also Parvati or yeah, she's also wow. Parvati. She's just mm -hmm. Parvati mm -hmm. in, a, in a mood. Yeah. <laughs> and she got you know, very. And there's so many statues and paintings of her with the tongue. Uh huh. Yeah, in different expressions. And, uh, but it's also that point of, you know, in our own anger, where I'm, you know, I, I don't physically slaughter anybody, but occasionally I'll criticize them in my mind. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, they don't like anything. Particularly you know, when I'm driving and trying to get off. And, Basically, I'm not seeing, you know, deeply who they are. They're uh -huh, just like sure. annoying creatures who are in my way. <laughs> and then if occasionally, you know, it's like I'll come to that point where all of a sudden I see, oh, that's, that's somebody's kid, you know, that mm -hmm. person I just wanted to strangle. Mm -hmm. It's actually, you know, somebody's kid. Mm -hmm. Actually, probably, you know. <laughs> and it's all, you, you see that inside the heart of all beings is Davy. And so then that's the cessation of the unstoppable cycle of violence mm -hmm. uh, and anger. You know, even when you, like, I myself, then I know a few people who become very angry at their own anger because they know that... That's the only angry. thing worth being angry with. Yeah. And then they become angry at the anger they're having towards their own anger. And these are like stubborn people. And they go like ten layers of Anger, 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 and it's not till the right they see who's they, actually they turn it back who, who on is self and will help. And it turn it back on the on, yes. on Shiva, who is just you know, the Devi. And mm -hmm. then it's like oh, and then it's just like oh. I think it was well. Shiva gets out of control. Remember oh, the whole story of Uma and Parvati. Yeah, he does. After Parvati gets killed, or they kills herself. 
And Shiva gets really pissed off. Oh, yeah. He's about to destroy the universe with his heat. And then Bhavati has to get reborn, he has to fall in love with her again and calm down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's well, that's how Ganesha got his head. What? He got an elephant head because his Oh yeah, no, that's what he, his dad, yeah. Yeah. Shiva, yeah. got pissed at him. You know, because he was a literist. He was a kid, you know. Who, Shiva? No, Ganesha. Yeah, I know. But he had a human head when he was a little kid. No, I know he was. And yeah. he disturbed them making love. So. Oh, that's she the real story. Him. Oh, that's the real story. Oh, that's the real story. <laughs> and then she kicked, kicked him out. She kicked him out and said, you better go fix that son of yeah. And then he went out and he found that elephant and chopped his head off and plunked Oh, that's how she cut off the head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, another story that's more family oriented <laughs> <laughs> is that Shiva went out, you know, to travel around. Yeah. He, he told Yanesha to watch the door and not let anybody come into their house. Uh-huh. Okay. And so Ganesha was like a, you know, a little perfect right. uh, godly kid. And, and so and then Shiva came back, you know, to test him when he first left. You know, he came back as UPS, uh, <laughs> postman, and all these things. And it, the kid would always say, you can't come in, you know, don't you protect the house. Finally, after a long, long time, Shiva came back as himself because he was finished with his you know, great journey. And he comes up to the house, honey, I'm home, Bharati, how it is. And he's just about to embrace his wife, and the little boy says, You can't come in. So he was still following the orders <laughs> right, right, right. of his father, and his father got a little like, because he took it literally, he didn't understand the order of the context. And yeah. so the father just went. <laughs> Just cut, kind of sliced off his head. Oh, that's another version. Okay. Yeah, similar, but similar. Yeah. <laughs> and then immediately they go. Oh. <laughs> and so they. Well, Shiva does become domesticated by it, quite a bit, actually. I, I like the one in the poem where they say, you know, may may the um, pleasure of uh, Shesha before your good fortune, you know, then, then sort of the end line of the, of the verse. And they say when, when he sits with Skanda and warms himself in the fire of the third, Shiva's third eye, and then in the earlier lines in the verses, Shesha is complaining to Skanda about how Shiva always insists on playing strip poker with Uma and he always loses and then he has to take everything off and then she makes me take, he makes him take me off and throws me out in the cold and I get warm and then the, then Skanda, the Kumara, you know, the Gaurabur, her, their son, he says, oh, don't worry, we just go and I just uh, hold on, I get, we'll keep warm by the fire of his third eye, which you know, still now still functions even though he's embracing it. Oh my, his third eye is still blazing. So I was thinking of some bum sitting out with a fire in a garbage can, you know, they're like warming himself. Yeah, yeah. Sheja and Kumar. So it's very domestic. It's Shiva constantly loses. He cannot defeat Uma in all poker. Time. Yeah. poker. And so he's always having to take everything off. She has him scrub off the cemetery ashes and stuff. Yeah, she makes him clean right, up. Because he's dirty. Yeah. yeah, well, he's covered with human yeah, he, bone cemetery ash. Yeah. He's the hippie. Yep. He's a total hippie. He's, you know, he's kind of outside. He was always rejected by proper orthodox. Yes, yeah, so well, that's why he's probably died. Yeah. And Shesha, you know, is the serpent. So yes, the cosmic serpent. The cosmic serpent of residue. Um, and so Shiva always wears around the neck, and you know, the arms, and his belt. It's really nice. He has him in the hair. And uh, quite uh, scary. He told the original hippie. Yeah. <laughs> India is special. Bharat. <laughs> Bharat. Uh, yeah. Anyway. And then the, the function of Kundalini, of yes. the AV, of yes. uh, is the uh, digestion uh -huh. or the cleaning up of shesha. Uh -huh. uh, so, so what, whatever you you know, any any action will have residue, mm -hmm. and any attempt to you know, even in sacrifice, uh -huh. 
And so even your yoga is internal sacrifice where you put everything into the mandala, the mm -hmm. chakra. Mm -hmm. And then when it's finally balanced through vinyasa, mm -hmm. uh, then it's offered. Mm -hmm. And okay. then, then it has a seed that then goes on you know, to more, more and more subtle levels. And even when the central channel opens, the, the prana flows, there's still residue. Uh -huh. And you know, this is what then what... Where, where, where is what residue? Oh, the residue is miscellaneous, because residue by definition is miscellaneous. Uh -huh. It can't be categorized. Uh -huh. you know, it, it's the failure of uh, the story of the mind, mm -hmm. of space, time, of language to completely say it. Or okay. embrace it. Okay. And so everything turns out, because everything slips then out of the category. So uh, all you have yeah. is a, the whole thing is Shesha. Uh -huh. It's a big pile. Yeah, the leftover. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this is Kundalini's food. Mm -hmm. This is what she laps up. Mm -hmm. So she has an infinite supply. The, 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 the guardian deity of the northern door of the mandalas, various mandalas, is Amrita Kundalini. Oh. It's a male deity, Amrita Kundari, and I think it connects Northern Door, which is which is a fierce thing. I never like to say wrathful, fierce. Yeah. They're fierce, but they're not really angry. Well, that's very nice. Wonderful. Yeah, Amrita Kundari. Yeah, so all of all of these images, you know, Kundalini being feminine, uh, Sushumna is feminine, mm -hmm. um, Devi feminine. Uh, in mythology, the same functions, different stories are than male. So they, they, it's always switched back and forth mm -hmm. uh, consistently, mm -hmm. intelligently. So. I love that in the, in the fifth chapter of Kava Chakra, uh, Tantra, commentary, Vimala Prabha, uh, the stainless light, there's a long discourse about, discursion about how a Buddha body has no atoms. It's a body without atoms. That's too coarse for it. It's made of this pure energy, pure clear light energy, without entering into the atomic. But it can simulate it being engaged with the atomic, with other beings trapped in the atomic form, but it has also actually no atom. Makes a big part about that. So the idea, of, that's where magic, I think, can happen, is where, where the, from the level of the pure energy that is, that is you know, the, all that spooky action at a distance, you know, the, the electrons spinning, thousand right. miles apart, right. affecting each other instantaneously. Faster than the speed of light. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, this is all area of, of pure, and then this idea of clear light, when you're in the Book of the Dead, when you, or in dead, all of the tantras, when you go down out of your coarse elements, and you have a coarse prana that you leave, and you go into space, luminance, radiance, and in the consciousness space, luminance, radiance, imminence, and then clear light. And then you're, you're down in that area below the atom, atomic. And then there's, a, there's another kind of prana there that is, doesn't venture into, into weaving the atoms together functions inside of that. But it can also do it. So I'm, oh yeah, and so it's like you it's as if you were withdrawing from everything. Because you leave all the core senses. But then when you get to that tiny, that super micro pinpoint, then it's infinite. And there's no difference between a pin but micro and macro, it's no difference. So it's sort of isn't that right? So is that does that correspond? Oh yeah. That's the level that we have to have. Did you guys want to do some questions from the crowd before we closed? What's that? Questions. We have a few minutes. Where is, where is Jason? I'm right here. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, good. Question, so any come questions on. from the crowd? Let's have a question from somebody who's still conscious. I have a question uh, for Richard and Mary. Um, this morning when we were doing the meditation with the swan, uh, how is she sitting? Is she sitting in lotus or is she sitting with her legs? Oh, either way. 
Yeah. Because I took a poll. <laughs> this one. We were talking about and this morning when we were Well, a lot of people swan. were more well, sitting on the lotus. Uh, oh, yeah. People were, people here. People were thought, lotus. well, the, the, the 10 people or so I asked, I think Lotus won. <laughs> I just thought there was a definite. How's that? How's that, right? Well, it's a goose, right? The house is a swan. Yeah. It is a swan. Yeah. No, but with that, with that okay. visualization, one thing that is very powerful is the the sense of the is feathers. The type of a bird? You know the, how if you've ever petted a bird, you so felt right the sense of the feathers. That's some species. That's the thing that brings it to earth. Standards. However, you're sitting. So being rather than just perching, holding it. What? Karanda. Crown chow. More questions. Crown chow. Crown chow is the sage. We're sage the geese. We split them. Okay. Okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question about: Is there an equivalent, um, like a yogic scripture, that's the equivalent to the Tibetan Book of the Dead? Good question. Here. Oh, is there an equivalent yoga scripture to the Tibetan Book of the Dead? I don't think so. Uh, where you're actually being guided through bardos. No, but that doesn't mean there isn't. There. So there's nothing. Well, there's not there, there, something there, that's no talked about in the yogic no. community. Also, no of? other Buddhist culture than Tibetan has that book. Although that came from India, they consider. And the uh, Indian Buddhist scientific literature mm -hmm. contains that knowledge. But it isn't, it isn't organized in a mass market yes. sort of thing like the Book of the Dead became. Which means the Book of Natural Liberation by learning uh, in the between. By hearing, actually, in the between. The drawing. And, uh, and uh, it's very unique, actually. Really quite a marvelous thing. You know, I, I consider there's such, such a thing, did, we don't have that in the Buddhist category, but it's like Tantric Abhidharma. You know, there, there's Mahayana, there's, there's Theravada Abhidharma, then there's Mahayana Abhidharma, then there's Tantric Abhidharma. And all those scientific Shastras are like uh, Abhidharma, really, but at a very super subtle level. Okay, um, the pranayama, where we were buzzing, the sound it was like buzzing, what, what was the name of that? Brahmari. Brahmari. What is the connection, can you detail that, between Brahmari and Kachar Mudra? You mentioned it, but I didn't totally follow that. Well, we'd have to actually practice it to okay. get the true connection. But, if you're humming away, If you're, um, you're vibrating the, the palate in, in a way that the, so the anuswara, so swara is the, 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 the sound tone, the flow of the tone, and it anus, meaning it tapers off endlessly, like a fractal, it's to the point that it, it seems to disappear. And it's disappearing back up to the, the root of the palate, or the, the which is called the, the chandra, or the, it's the, in the thousand-petaled lotus, there's this little reservoir for nectar, and that's where, that's the root of the palate. And, and so the kachari mudra is if you can get your tongue to connect, either literally you can get your, through some training, uh, you can get your tongue to stand straight up behind your soft palate, so the tip of your tongue will push against the sphenoid sinus. So the sphenoid tonsil, it's in the sphenoid sinus, is the sphenoid tonsil. It, and you can actually push your tongue against that. And it tends to make you like go out there. <laughs> and that's the, the complete of the proper kachari mudra. Um, some people think, well you don't actually have to do that if you are just extremely 
uh, quiet and you meditate on how the tongue uh, contacts the palate, so it can contact the palate in different ways, uh, you'll feel that connection. And so it's almost like the sensations of the palate extend the tongue. And so it's like, and so the language function ceases. Okay, so every time, whenever you're thinking, you're thinking actually language. It's not spoken language necessarily, it's not words, it could be any kind of conceptualization or anything that comes up. And so, but, and so the prana moves in relation to whatever the, the formation of the mind is. And if you can get the prana to become suspended, uh, nirodha, prana vritti nirodha, uh, is basically what you work on in hatha yoga. Um, and it's very nice, you know, I mean, if people know anything about it, they hear that, oh my God, I'd never do that. But, but in the training for Kacharya Mudra, uh, you have to massage your tongue, get it longer, and then you have to cut that little... Membrane there. And then, yeah, so that, and then you massage it, and then you can flip it back push it up. Okay. And, and I've only imagined, just imagine. You cut it with a blade of pushback grass. Yeah, you take a blade of grass. And every day you cut it and it takes, you know, a few weeks to cut through. The only a few weeks? Yeah. Really? Well, because those are, grass is sharp. I'm wimpy grass. <laughs> <laughs> you do it slightly and then you massage it with like, oh, like turmeric. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, you can do it Jiva Bandha, uh, which means the tongue, tongue Bandha, uh, which could do it for you if you're sensitive. And that's basically the connection of tongue palate and their different ways. We did that last you used year. To get out, you can rub that membrane on your lower teeth. Yeah, you could cut it on your own lower teeth and you just walk around. <laughs> <laughs> or you can push the tongue straight up on the hard palate like <laughs> Which is not, and these are, these help, you know, it almost locks the prana pattern. So you can do kumbhakas. If you can't do jalandarabandha, which a lot of people can't do easily because they're, you know, they're just the way they're structured. Uh, you can do jiva bandha. And there are different ways of doing it. You know, you can press the tongue, you can go like a yaksha. <laughs> he lives in Thailand, so I can No, yuck. Or you can take the tongue of the soft palate, and get, it's very gentle, and you just put it on the soft palate, and you go. When you really hear the nada, that's when your right eyebrow goes up, though, right? <laughs> but with that meditation and that pranayama, you, it, it automatically begins to soften the palate. And so, wouldn't you say <clears throat> that it automatically, a lot of times we're talking about soften the palate, release the palate, and that just like some of the other things we were doing with the exhale that automatically tone the pelvic floor, that automatically gives you the sensation that, the, that you can then cultivate more deeply um, in other forms. So it's, it's kind of a nice thing to do. And you get the, the and just the palate, it's very interesting. Uh, so I would say if you have a sense of humor, that will help you release your palate. <laughs> And then there's this whole idea of kenosis, kenosis. or knowledge. Yeah. Kenosis is like na, na, yeah, the ya, yeah, yeah, like the kena thing. And I got kaitonia kenosam, you kind of feel it. Kenoid. I understand that. You grab it with the back of your nose. Um, I have to call it like that. But, and that's just a lame theory, but this is the, <laughs> the meaning of the word no, 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 no,
<laughs> yeah, but that's actually they're ta they're intimately related. To, um, the thing about Nya lines here, my intuition thing about Nya and no gnosis. Gnosis is a super special spiritual word, right? You know, in, 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 in amongst the people. Yeah. And whereas intuition is an ordinary word. Yeah. And jnana is the most ordinary word for knowledge. And yet, ordinary. at the high level, is this primal knowledge. You know, knowledge that you always had when you get it, you realize you always had it. And that's really special. But still, it's just also the same as super ordinary knowledge. Which is really good because what it, it, it relates to this thing that uh, when when you when you're enlightened you realize that you you and everybody else always were so it was right in your ordinary yeah. everything was right there in all of your interconnections with everybody but everybody misses it because they're off in some other place you know, mentally so that's really cool it's nine o'clock and so um, why don't we rehearse dying. <laughs> before you go to sleep. Just really quickly. Just one minute, okay? Meditate. Go into meditative mode. I know you want to pass out. It's only take two minutes. Okay? So, meditating. And then, your earth element, your sense of solidity, slips into fluidity. And you see a sign, and you like have a hallucination or a mirage-like sign. Ideally, you would see a bluish mirage, like a water mirage in a desert, you know, or something. You would see a mirage sign. Then your fluidity slips into thermality, heat, fire. And then you see smoky. And then you have an inner sign, not with your physical eyes, but in your inner, inner vision, third eye vision, in, the, in your inner eye. It's everything you're filled with smoke. And then your fire slips into motility, which is wind, uh, prana, in a way, vayu. And you have a vision of shower of sparks, or ideally more cool, swarm of fireflies. Greenish, blinking, swirling, mass of host of fireflies. And then your your motility, your wind, slips into space. And you have a vision of space slash consciousness. And you have a vision of pure candle flame. Like very still candle flame. Not guttering candle flame, very still candle flame. Then that space consciousness slips into luminance, luminosity, luminance, which is like a cloudless sky filled with moonlight. No moon, just light, that's the light of moon. And you go, you're gone into that. Like you already were a little bit in space going into it, and you have a, you have you just everything is just moonlight, and then luminance slips into radiance, and by your consciousness involuntarily expanding in the vast space moonlit space, it becomes some sort of explosive, and then you have this reddish, orangish sunlight space, pure sunlight everywhere, very bright. And then, the, then radiance goes into what I call imminence, meaning something about to happen, imminence. And imminence is dark. It's so dark, it's a bright black. And it's, you, you, go, you gravitate to it because the brightness of the solar radiance was so intense. Although you don't have eyes that are being bothered, but it's just so hot, you know. So you slip into this darkness. And then from imminence, where you more or less lose consciousness, but you try to keep one vein of awareness of yourself as unconscious, if you will, a little bit complicated. And then it becomes transparency, or clear light, where you, it's like a gray, it's like a cloudless sky filled with the gray pre-dawn twilight, where you can sort of see your hand, but you can't see the lines in the palm of the hand. 
And so, but yet that's also not a helpful thing because in a way it's also like a glass or like a diamond, like something transparent. So in a way everything is visible, all differentiated things in that are visible, but since they're transparent you can choose to just focus on infinity and not see them. Or you can shift your field of focus and perceive them as differentiated objects. That's a, that's a metaphor I like to use, but no metaphor can explain experience of clear light. You can't really have that experience. You can give yourself to clear light. You can be clear light. Okay? So that eightfold uh, eight step process is really useful, like when you fall asleep, when you, when you meditate, you know, you can think about that eight step process. And then, then of course, when you wake up, you come back up. You come up through the darkness, to the solar, to the lunar, to the to the candle flame, to the firefly swirling, to the smoke and to the mirage, and then back into habitual normal reality. Okay? So sweet dreams. Have a nice sleep. Thank you. We'll come back to that. Actually you can take the This video was brought to you in part the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special invites to trips around the world with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit TibetHouse.us.